Medical terminology is the language of medicine. That's how we communicate with one another as clinicians. This chapter is a brief overview of that. Obviously, we can't teach you Amarillo College's three credit hour medical terminology course in a 30 minute quick overview lecture. You'll get the basics here. You'll use these basics to build your vocabulary of medical terms and the use of medical terminology throughout the rest of this course using the basics you get here today. You should be able to use those as a foundation to, to walk out of here talking like a medical professional, which is what you will be after you leave this course. Medical terminology uses breakdown that you learned in school a long time ago. We have abbreviations, we have symbols, we have acronyms, we have key terms. Be careful with those acronyms. We speak to one another in acronyms. Acronyms aren't universally understood. They're definitely not understood by our patients. And our goal is to communicate in a manner that benefits our patients, not in a way that creates confusion. I'll give you give you an example here. An old medical abbreviation for shortness of breath was SOB. SOB is understood throughout the world, the English speaking world, to be something else. So if you document that your patient is having SOB, then that can create confusion. And if you land in court and your patient care report is subpoenaed, it can be embarrassing, it can be difficult to explain, it can create problems. So stick with uh, terms like dyspnea, difficulty breathing. There are, there are examples like that throughout medicine. We know what we're talking about person to person with slang terms, they can cause problems and documentation needs to be straightforward. It needs to be something that everyone is going to understand who touches that patient care report. So what do you need to do? What do you need to know? You need to understand how medical terms are formed. We've all seen medical terms that look like a word that's three feet long. It's broken into 42 syllables and we don't understand what it means. If you break it down into the root word, prefix, the suffix, and any other modifying syllables, you'll be able to, to determine what that word means. Sounds familiar, huh? A root word, a prefix, a suffix, no, this isn't an English class, but that is how medical terms are assembled to arrive at the meaning that we want to convey. Let's take a look at some of those. Uh, there, are, there are syllables that sound similar. We have to be careful with those. Phasia, phasia and phagia, that sounds pretty darn close means two entirely different things. Phasia with an S means speaking. Phagia with a G means swallowing. So if we say that, that our patient is experiencing dysphagia, we could be talking about difficulty speaking. We could be saying dysphagia, which means difficulty swallowing. So we have to enunciate. As Texans, that's not the easiest thing, right? I have a little trouble with that myself. Accurate spelling is important. Uh, people judge us by our words. They, uh, they judge us by our usage of words and even our spelling of words. And as you can see with this example here, spelling can totally change what we're talking about in a term related to patient assessment, patient care. You have to have a knowledge of anatomy. We worked on that in chapter six. We have to we have to know anatomic parts. We have to understand how to correctly use those. 
and combine those with the medical terminology that that we accumulate throughout this course and in the end like I said you'll be speaking like the medical professional that you are the root word that or root word has my mouth doesn't do that again I'm from Texas it conveys the basic meaning what we're talking about let's use an example cardio is heart right knew that before you got here you might not have known that pulmon is the root word meaning lungs so pulmonary would be pertaining to the lungs pulmonology would be study of the lungs or a pulmonologist would be a doctor specializing in diseases and disorders of lungs cardiologist would be a doctor who specializes in diseases and disorders of the heart so learning those root words is very important we have to know what those are then we can add prefixes and suffixes to arrive at the meaning we desire and one word can convey the message that it would take an entire sentence or two to to convey if we didn't use medical terminology so what do prefixes do for us we already know these from from school we know that tri is three we know by is two we know quad is four uh, auto uh, automaticity we use that word in our overview of the human body and we, I told you that automaticity is the ability of cardiac cells any single cardiac cell to take over and pace the heart it's a fail-safe mechanism it's a backup to the normal conduction system of the heart so auto operating on its own right autopilot flies that airplane on its own sub is below uh, we'll pick up these prefixes as we go uh, but and here's something important to point out when you come upon a new term as you go through these chapters and you will find several new terms in every chapter take time look up the word if you don't know what it means there's a good glossary in the back of your book you can also Google Uncle Google is good at helping us find the definitions to words you don't have to understand all the origin of the word and all the all this stuff going back 500 years you need to know what the word means so that you understand the material in the chapters without it you're going to be lost half the time terms that are used in exams and uh, as you read through a a scenario in an exam question if you don't understand the medical terms you won't understand what the question is asking for and is going to undermine your ability to be successful in this class let's take the good old word pania we use it every day in our language right it sounds like a some kind of bread that you used to make a sandwich it always did to me anyway uh, so let's let's say that we can agree that pania means breathing so a pania a in medical terminology that a prefix means without apnea without breathing suckers not breathing there you go he's apneic that uh braid ipnic oh wow Man, what does that mean? Brady means slow. Bradyhypnic would be a slow respiratory rate. We know that in adults, the normal the normal rate per minute is 12 to 20. So bradyhypnia would be breathing less than 12 times per minute in an adult. Tachy, that's fast. Tach, tachypnia would be rapid breathing, breathing faster than that 12 to 20 normal range in an adult so respirate tachypnic respirations in an adult tells us well they're breathing more than 20 times a minute and then we can uh, as we list vital signs we can better describe that those are terms that you need to very be very familiar with let's use another cardia we said was the heart let's say cardiac mean uh, that is pertaining to let's say it pertains to the heart rate so 
bradycardic or bradycardic, but bradycardic is how you pronounce it, that would be a slow heart rate in an adult less than 60 beats per minute. Tachycardic would be a rapid heart rate and that would be greater than 100 beats per minute in an adult. So we know that normal range, 60 to 100, bradycardic lower than 60, tachycardic higher than 100. Suffixes, they convey various, uh, various, various uh, meanings to us. So let's try one, itis, that means inflammation. So carditis would be inflammation of the heart muscle. Pneumonitis, pneumo having to do with the lungs. Pneumonitis would be inflammation of the lungs. Oh, let's see. How about arthro? That's joints. Arthritis, inflammation of the joints. That's how this works. Gastroenterology. Wow. I, I know several gastroenterologists here in town. What do they do? They study diseases of the and disorders of the stomach and intestines. Gastro, stomach, hepato, hepato is liver, arthro joint, we already said that. Osteo, bone, osteologist would be a doctor who studies the bones, right? Pulmonologist, we already talked about. Sorry about. Plurals, uh, plurals are a strange thing in medicine. Uh, oh, let's let's hit a few, and then we're going to move on. We don't need to waste a bunch of time here. Uh, vertebra is one. Vertebrae is more than one. We don't say vertebras or vertebras. That sounds well. We won't even go there, right? Okay. Uh, diagnoses, that's more than one diagnosis. Apices, you'll hear us talk about auscultating or listening to with a stethoscope. The apices of the lungs, that is the, the top of the upper fields, the toward the head of your patient, the upper fields of the lungs. That would be the apices of the lungs. Prefixes, that conveys things such as numbers. We already talked about mononucleosis. Mono, that's one, right? Then we only have to know what nucleosis is. Uh, let's see, what's a, what's a uh, bifurcate, a bifurcation of a vein? That would be where it splits and like the branch of a tree. So if you have one vein it splits into two branches then those two split into four those bifurcations are where those where those split off let's talk about colors Cy cyano that's blue cyanosis that is blue skin color not a good thing unless you're a smurf right you may not you may not be old enough to remember those smurf cartoons i don't know you know one Diplo 2, Diplococcus, that would be a bacteria, uh, certain type of morphology of a bacteria. Uh, ab, abduction, abduction, uh, circumferential going all the way around. Uh, epi toward the surface uh, supra supraventricular above the ventricles that would be the atria of the heart those are supraventricular chambers in the heart directional terms those are great for where an injury is located how pain radiates within the body we have right and left uh, let's use an example example there 
usually write this on the board. Obviously, I don't have a board in front of me, so let's use uh, Dexter and Sinister. One sounds like maybe a guy's name, a different kind of guy's name. I have a couple of friends named Dexter. Don't have any friends named Sinister, though I might have some Sinister friends. Dexter and Sinister. Dexter refers to the right and Sinister refers to the left. So you have a uh, your right eye. If we're right, if we're still using hand charting and we use the accepted medical abbreviation for the right eye would be OD, Oculus Dexter. If we use the old abbreviation of OS, that's Oculus Sinister. That's the left eye. AS is the left ear, Auditorus Sinister. Uh, and then Auditorus Dexter would be the right ear. We don't use those as much anymore, but they are out there. Lateral and medial, proximal and distal. We'll work on those in class. Uh, superficial is toward the surface of the skin, toward the surface of the body. And deep, we don't have a fancy term for that. Deep, it would be a deep laceration versus a superficial laceration. Uh, superficial, just cut through the skin, doesn't go very deep. A deep laceration conveys a meaning of, meaning of tearing down into muscle, getting down into those deep tissues. Ventral and dorsal, we talked about the other day briefly. The dorsum of your hand is the palm side. The ventral aspect of your hand is what we would normally call the back of our hand. Palmer and plantar. Anybody ever have plantar warts when you were a kid? I was always afraid I was going to get those because kids in, in PE class who had plantar warts had to go have surgery and have those things cut out. Oh, man, just sounded like a horrible thing to me. And I thought they were plantar warts, like, like you plant seeds. And I was worried those seeds were going to get out of somebody else's feet into mine. Turns out it has to do with that plantar or sole of the foot, the plantar aspect of the foot. Superior nearer to the head, inferior toward the feet. Uh, a six centimeter laceration, four centimeters superior to the medial malleolus right medial malleolus. That would be a laceration on the medial side of the right leg, just above that knobby uh, protrusion on the inside of the ankle. So all of those terms convey a message with regard to where lacerations, contusions, fractures, all of those kinds of things are. Lateral is away from the midline. Medial is toward the midline. So let's look at this little example. Five centimeter laceration on the medial aspect of the thigh. Well, that's easy, right? Five, and by the way, we use the metric system in medicine. A five centimeter laceration is close to somewhere between an inch and a half and two inches, I think. But this laceration that we're talking about here is five centimeters long. It's on the inside of the thigh. Then we can further define that by, uh, like, like I said earlier, uh, five centimeter laceration, 10 centimeters on the medial aspect of the right, th the, the right thigh, 10 centimeters superior to the right knee. And that gets us down to, we could almost go make a surgical incision in that location, right? We're getting close. Let's don't do that. It's outside your scope of practice. Dang it. Proximal closer to the trunk, distal further away from the trunk. Uh, that was kind of confusing, I think, to some of you as you read this chapter. 
uh, because it the book I don't think that especially the diagram wasn't really clear it it mentioned something being had a had a diagram and it mentioned something it I think it showed a, a mark on a diagram of the arm and wanted to know whether that was proximal distal etc and the answer was proximal because it was closer to the trunk but some of you thought it was distal because it was almost down to the elbow so it's Proximal and distal has to do with the trunk of the body. Most of the time, you'll learn to, to kind of break that down a little bit better and be more precise with that over the course of the semester. Uh, I've already done a superficial sunburn. Uh, superficial burns used to be call, called first degree burns, like a sunburn. Just that top layer of the skin is burned. It's kind of red. Let's say we're going to talk about a full thickness burn. Wow, that sounds bad because it is. We used to call those a third degree burn. Burns through all the layers of the skin. Gets down there toward the muscle. Those burns require skin grafts to heal. Horribly painful. Not because the third degree burn itself Hurts, we burned up all the nerves. You'll learn about this toward the end of the semester. But third degree burns have second degree burns along with them, which would be a partial thickness burn. So we have partial thickness burns make it part, make it deeper into the skin, down where the nerves are, and those things hurt really bad. They have those are the ones that blister. Uh, I've even seen second degree sunburns. Uh, those, those are painful. Those can leave scars. Those are a bad deal. Eventually those can give rise to skin cancers. Let's don't be getting those folks. Ventral and dorsal. We talked about this the other day. The, the ventral, ventral aspect of the body is the anterior surface, the belly side. And the dorsal side is the spine side. Remember the dorsal fin of a fish that I talked about, that big old catfish that you caught when you were a kid and you were afraid to touch it because your grandpa said, don't get, a, don't get a hold of that dorsal fin. It'll stick right through your hand. I don't want to be wearing a fish to school, so I don't want to touch those things. More often we use anterior surface of the body, posterior surface. Occasionally we'll use dorsal and ventral, but uh, we use those more with regard to the hands and feet. We've already talked about palmar and plantar. Right. You can raise your hand and ask me a question about them right now if you want. Oh, no questions. We're moving on. Apices, apex of the heart. Oh man, this screws you up. All right, I didn't just say that, did I? It'll mess you up because the apex of the heart, since I just said the apices of the lungs are that domed part up toward the top, right below your clavicles, your collarbones, just, just inferior to your clavicles. Well, man, the apex of the heart must be the very top, right? Wrong. Apex of the heart is that tip of the heart so it's a little different uh, that one I always had trouble wrapping my head around that for some reason but that is the apex of the heart down there the more pointy end of the heart flexion bending of a joint extension dorsal flexion and dorsal extension when I have my when I'm assessing my patient and I have I instruct them to pull their toes up toward the top of their head as far as they can with both feet, I am assessing dorsal flexion. If I tell them to push both toes down like you're pushing down on gas pedals of a car, then that is dorsal extension. That is very important, especially when we add a little bit of pressure and have them pull up on our hands. We can assess to see whether they they pull equally on both of our hands. What are we testing there? We're checking to see 
if they have equal strength from side to side. Very important part of assessment. Adduction and abduction. Abduction, moving away from the midline. Have somebody hold their hands beside their sides and, and raise their arm up. Keep their arm straight, raise their arm up to their side. That is abduction. That's moving away from the midline. You have them pull it back down. That's adduction. We use that to assess range of motion in so shoulders and assess for things like maybe uh, a rotator cuff tear, something of that nature. Bilateral, both sides. Unilateral, one side. So if we have chest rise equal bilaterally when our patient takes a deep breath, both lungs are inflating, things are looking good. If we have, le if we have yef left unilateral chest rise, then the right side isn't inflating. We need to go figure out why. Quadrants uh, that breaks it into four pieces. We talked about the other that the other day when we had that transverse section and that sagittal section that that intersection of 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 points at the umbilicus that divides the abdomen into those four quadrants. Very important. We need to know these these directional terms, we need to use these directional terms. It lets someone, if we're giving a radio report and we properly describe our findings when we assess our patient, on the other end of that radio, whoever takes your radio report should be able to visualize exactly what you're talking about. A, a, large caliber gunshot wound, two centimeters medial to the left nipple. That is very, what, what do we have there? Two centimeters, there's an important structure that might have been involved with that gunshot wound. Our patient might be shot right through the heart by where we just, just described that. So. We need to use those descriptive terms so that somebody on the other end knows what we're talking about. And it'd be too convenient to say, he shot right through the heart. That's, well, dang, that's bad. What part of his heart? I don't know. He's just shot right through his heart. Okay. Anatomic position. Uh, we've talked about what? normal anatomic position is the other day, right? We're talking about something different here. Uh, we're talking about how we find our patient. Let's say our patient was involved in a, a, car, a car accident, ejected from the vehicle, and we find them in a muddy ditch in a prone position. Well, they are positioned face down in that muddy ditch versus supine would mean that they're lying face up. Fowler position, this is important. Uh, we will use this the rest of the semester. This is a semi-sitting position or a semi-reclining position with the head elevated. So a semi-Fowler's position would be, uh, that's, that's a normal, comfortable position with the, with the head and chest about halfway between supine and and bolt upright, so semi-fowler position. High fowler position is sitting straight up. If I have a patient who is having a, a bad bout with their emphysema, and I state that my patient was found seated in a high fowler position dyspneic and cyanotic upon arrival, our arrival at the scene. Oh, what have I just said? My patient is sitting straight up, is having trouble breathing. My patient is dyspneic, they're having difficulty breathing, sitting straight up. This isn't looking good for my patient right now. I got to do something about this, right? 
and my patient is cyanotic, cyano blue. This isn't good. My patient has blue, has blue skin. More likely, I will say that my patient, if this is accurate, has circumoral cyanosis, circum around oral the mouth, circumoral cyanosis has blue lips, right? That is not good. My patient is not being perfused well. The patient's not getting good supply of oxygen and carbon dioxide is building up and my patient is going to, we'll use a precise medical term here, my patient's going to crap out if I don't do something here. Don't want my patient to die so I have to do something, right? That's what this class is about. When we, do the, when we study the respiratory chapter, you'll learn what to do. But if I tell you in a scenario that you arrive, you walk into a dimly lit room, you find an 82-year-old male patient seated in high fowler position, dyspneic, dyspneic tachypneic, and cyanotic, at presenting with circumoral cyanosis, you know you have a patient with emphysema who is in bad shape, and you've got to do something right now, or that person might die. There you go. High Fowler, 90 degree angle. Semi Fowler, kick back at that 45 degree angle. Live in large, letting us wait on them, give them that, that horizontal taxi ride to the hospital, right? We do some of that. It's not all light sirens, blood, gore, and guts, and, and everybody needs the full capacity of what we're able to do. Some people just want to ride to the hospital to get their prescription filled. We take those folks to the hospital. We will take a blood take a full set of vital signs on that patient. We will assess that patient because we're going to always meet the standard of care, right? Even if we don't feel like it. It's part of being a professional. Okay, let's rock on here. See what else we can find. Oh, nephropathy. This is not good. Uh, nephro, kidneys, pathy, disease, disease of the kidneys. Let's try another one. Dysuria. We don't want some of this, right? Difficulty, painful, abnormal urination. Oh, we sure don't want some of that. Uh, dysuria sounds a whole lot better than than it burns really bad when I go pee. That's we don't want to be saying that on the radio, right? So we use terms like dysuria, hematoemesis, hemato. Uh, that's blood. Emesis is vomiting. So hematoemesis is vomiting up blood. Hyperemesis is excessive vomiting. Uh, Kilo will do that to folks. We get to haul those folks to the hospital too, and we get to clean up after them. And this, uh, this is a glamorous profession, folks, I'm telling you. All right, let's try a different, uh, well, it's, we're, we're done with vomiting, right? We move on. All right. Uh, analgesic. Uh, without pain, make something stop hurting. Uh, administer an, an analgesic medication prior to suturing. Numbed it up so you can stitch it, right? Abbreviations, acronym, and symbols. As I said to start with, before I really cut my stride here, I, it's in this lecture. You're saying, dude, you haven't caught your stride yet. But be careful with them. Uh, I used SOB as an example. Uh, we have all kinds of acronyms that we use around the station. And when we talk to one another, and when we talk to firemen and policemen, that mean zero to people in the hospital. So communicate accurately. Make sure people understand what you mean. Enunciate, like I said, that's a problem for me sometimes. I grew up in Borger, Texas. I can't help it. I can help it. I'm trying right now. EMT, ENT. ENT is an is a ears, nose, and throat doctor. EMT is what you aspire to be, right? Sample history. That may not mean much to, it should now, these terms are becoming more standard, but got a sample history on the patient. That may not mean much to people, some people in the hospital, particularly if 
let's say you transfer a patient from a nursing home and that patient's a direct admit to a floor at the hospital and you take them directly to the floor and you say, I got a sample history and it's blah, blah, blah. They may not know what in the world a sample history is. So we need to break that down into what it really means. DCAP BTLS, I can just about guarantee you unless somebody is working in the ER or they have ER experience and now they're working in a critical care area, they're not going to know what DCAP BTLS is. That's an important part of our assessment. We worked with that in lab the other day. Deformity, contusions, burns, tenderness, uh, lacerations, swelling, uh, DCAP BTLS means a lot in our world. Uh, it may not mean anything in the world of the clinician that you turn your patient over to at the hospital. So make sure we communicate that well. In the past, each hospital had its own acronyms, had its own list of accepted abbreviations. They even published little pamphlets that had accepted abbreviations and symbols to use in the hospital. And it could be confusing, especially if you worked around more than one hospital or doctors who primarily practiced at one hospital and occasionally went to another and there were mistakes all the time. So the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, JCO, JCO really started hammering hospitals to not use abbreviations and not, there are some standard ones that still stick around and symbols C with a line over it is with S with a line over it is without. We still use a lot of stuff like that. A with a line over it is before P with a line over it is after. You'll see me use those on the board. Well, you won't because we're not in class in the classroom so that I can use the board, but I use those all the time. Uh, our kids learned how to use those early on. My wife's a nurse. I'm a paramedic. And to read notes that we all wrote to one another, they had to learn to do those things when they were in grade school. When in doubt, don't use an abbreviation. When in doubt, don't use an acronym. Don't use a symbol. Make sure that it is something that is universally understood, whether it is in your geographic area, your service area, nationwide, make sure you stick with stuff that everybody knows and understands. That is a quick run through of medical terminology. Believe it or not, as I said, I am not going to teach you in one lecture how to ma master medical terminology, nor am I going to teach you a three credit hour class in medical terminology. Those are the basics. That's something to build from uh, tables in in this chapter, we'll give you a reference for common word roots, uh, how you combine prefixes, suffixes, combining letters, uh, some abbreviations. Use that as a reference. You might even put a, put a good old sticky note back there where that table is and where the, the glossary is at the end of your book so you can bounce around and grab those as you work through these chapters. So, so that you don't make any mistakes, I want you to understand these chapters. I want you to be able to utilize medical terminology. I can't really teach it to you. I can't do it for you. You're just going to have to work through it and get it. You guys are doing a great job in class so far. I have no doubt that you'll get this. You'll master it, and everybody will view you as the healthcare professionals that you're going to be. So, thank you, and I will get a couple more videos up today.